the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Voltairine Declare and the Stakes of Anarchist Free Love by Lauren J. Golder. In early 1897, American anarchist feminist and free love advocate Voltairine de Clare got an abortion. She had given worth once before in 1890, and she had hated both the bodily experience of pregnancy and the subsequent role of motherhood. The father of the fetus, Samuel Gordon, was not present for the abortion, but he later accused her of infidelity based on a rumor that she had visited the room of a drunken man on the same day as the procedure. While recovering from the abortion, Declare sent Gordon a letter excoriating him for sending her a letter, quote, full of injustice, writing that, quote, If you had to go through the horrible nausea, faintness, loss of ability to think, and the danger of the whole thing happening on the train or boat, if you had lain on the Fall River steamer as I did, with a corset stay inside of that organ which you delight in theorizing about, if you had stood as I did with Harry Kelly on the street corner and realized that the longed-for result was about to happen right there on the street, if you had gone through the fear of that, and being compelled to sit talking to people afterwards and wondering how you were going to get to the restroom in time. If you had had this happen at one o'clock and been compelled to lecture at three, if this had been your sequel of a pleasurable experience with me as it was mine with you, you would be ashamed to talk to me in such a way." End quote. Although Gordon claimed to be a supporter of free love and women's rights, his reaction to her abortion deeply troubled Declare. Gordon's jealousy and lack of empathy strained their relationship and amplified Declare's desire for freedom from monogamy and commitment. The couple parted ways soon after this incident. Voltairine Declare was a prolific writer, poet, and lecturer, and her work on feminism and free love are a place where anarchist theory and day-to-day life meet. Through her experiences of misogyny and her desire for independence, Declare created a radical vision of sex equality that rejected gender essentialism and saw romantic commitments as dangerous for women. Both in her writing and her life, she repudiated the notion that motherhood and family were a woman's highest calling, a common idea during this time period. These ideologies of motherhood, purity, and monogamy, she believed, work together to oppress women and reinforce their dependence on men. The American free love movement began in the early 19th century alongside the woman movement, and it remained on the radical fringe well into the 20th century. There were many varying interpretations of free love, which included issues such as sex education and contraception, non-monogamy, acknowledging women's sexual desire, and ending sexual violence. Although the lifestyles of free lovers varied greatly, they were united under the goal of sexual liberation and gender equality. Anarchist interpretations of free love were distinctly anti-authoritarian, framing sex radicalism as a protest both against patriarchy and against the state itself. Famed anarchist feminist Emma Goldman wrote that, quote, the defenders of authority dread the advent of free motherhood, lest it will rob them of their prey, end quote. The power structure of the family upheld the broader power structures of the state, church, and capital. Marriage and procreation served the interests of the state not only by creating workers, but also by making women economically dependent on men in order to support the capitalist machine. Gilded Age women were expected to do all domestic labor, making it possible for their husbands to work grueling schedules in America's growing factories. Thus, the task of liberating one's desire through free love 
was meant to be part of a broader anarchist program that would free individuals from the hierarchies that oppressed humanity. The stakes of free love were vastly different for men and women, even within the ostensibly egalitarian anarchist movement. Women and queer people took on greater physical and social risks as part of a sex radical practice, including risks of unwanted pregnancy, abandonment, and physical violence, as well as social isolation and stigma. However, these practices also held greater potential for women's and queer liberation than they did for straight cis men. Anarchist men typically discussed free love and radical intimacy as avenues to self-actualization and pleasure, whereas anarchist women, like Declare, were more focused on bodily autonomy, reproductive choice, and freedom from sexual assault. For women and queer people, free love had a greater transformative potential, but gender dynamics and male expectations, even among fellow anarchists, made this almost impossible to achieve. The argument between Voltaire Clare and Samuel Gordon following her abortion is a clear example of these gendered stakes. Declare risked her life in seeking an abortion in 1897, and she had to endure its agony as well as possible social and legal ramifications alone. Samuel Gordon's primary concern, on the other hand, was whether Declare had been seen flirting with another man. What was an issue of petty jealousy for Gordon was one of life and death for Declare. In the letter she wrote to Gordon after her abortion, Declare articulated a vision of free love that prioritized her and her partner's freedom. She wrote that, quote, I would rather die here in England and never see your beautiful face again than live to be the slave of my own affection for you. I will never let come what will accept the conditions of married slavery again. I will not do things for you. I will not live with you. For if I do, I suffer the tortures of owning and being owned. I will serve you as a friend on the terms of friendship if you will allow me. I don't want our love for one another to be an excuse for breaking down the barriers of individual ownership, whereby love is strained till it is lost. I shall not inquire into your actions outside of myself, and I don't want you to inquire into mine. End quote. Although anarchist feminists' rhetorical use of the term slavery to describe marriage during the post-Reconstruction era is troubling and perhaps worthy of its own essay, this passage is nevertheless a useful example of Declare's rejection of marriage and monogamy. A few years later, Declare wrote that her romantic relationship with Gordon had ended because he could not accept that she refused what she called the regular program of married life, exclusive possession, home, children, all that. Marriage, in her view, would have amplified the suffering of life under industrial capitalism, and both of those structures had to be rejected in order to create true freedom. Throughout her adult life, Declare rejected traditionalism and marriage. Her theory of anarchism took women's equality as a central premise and saw the destruction of the state as humanity's best hope for peace and freedom. We can see these ideals develop through several incidents in her personal life, underlining the old feminist idiom that the personal is political. In 1888, nine years before her aforementioned abortion, Declare met James B. Eliot, a carpenter and free thinker, while on a trip to Philadelphia. A year later, she moved in with Eliot and his mother. According to a friend, theirs was not a happy companionship, and their romance was brief in part because Eliot, like Gordon later, wanted traditional marriage and monogamy. Nevertheless, Declare became pregnant by Eliot in 1889 and endured a difficult pregnancy that exacerbated her ever-present chronic illness. She considered having an abortion in 1889, but was advised by a doctor that her health was too precarious for the procedure. She would later recall that, quote, I think I hardly laughed once in the year preceding and following Harry's birth, end quote. Declare gave birth to her son Harry in 1890, but she rejected the role of motherhood, viewing the pregnancy and her son as Elliot's responsibility. While possibly struggling with postpartum depression, Declare left Harry with the Elliots for a year after his birth, 
while she lectured for the Women's National Liberal Union in Kansas. This took place during a time in American history when motherhood and nurturing were considered women's natural roles and their primary paths toward personal fulfillment, ideas which declare soundly rejected. The extent of her relationship with her son after returning from Kansas is unclear. Some accounts said that she essentially abandoned him, while others show that she and Harry had occasional contact. Upon her return, she lived down the hall from Harry and the Elliots, but it appears that they had limited interactions. Bearing an unwanted child was the battlefield where the ideals of free love clashed with the realities of reproduction. Declared never wanted marriage, monogamy, or a family, but was unable to avoid childbearing despite her enthusiasm for free love and contraception. In an 1890 essay titled Sex Slavery, likely written during or shortly after her pregnancy with Harry, Declare wrote that it was, quote, the vilest of all tyranny when a man compels the woman he says he loves to endure the agony of bearing children that she does not want and for whom they cannot properly provide, end quote. At this time, it was relatively easy for a cis man to shrug off the responsibilities of parenthood, but it was nearly impossible for cis women to do the same. By refusing motherhood as her natural responsibility, Declare carved out some of the same freedoms from reproductive responsibility that men already enjoyed. Indeed, male hypocrisy was another target of her invective. Declare condemned men who, like Gordon, claimed to be anarchists, but nevertheless expected a traditional marriage and domestic arrangement. She criticized male anarchists for maintaining patriarchal relationships in their own households, even as they advocated for the end of hierarchy outside. In a particularly scalding excerpt, she wrote, quote, so pickled is the male creation with the vinegar of authoritarianism that even those who have gone further and repudiated the state still cling to the old idea that they are to be heads of the family. No longer than a week since an anarchist said to me, I will be the boss in my own house. A communist anarchist, if you please, who doesn't even believe in my house. About a year ago, a noted libertarian speaker said, in my presence, that his sister, who possessed a fine voice and had joined a concert troupe, should stay at home with her children because that was her place. That old church idea. This man was a socialist and since an anarchist, yet his highest idea for woman was serfhood to her husband and children in the present mockery called home. End quote. Declare saw the persistence of patriarchal ideas among anarchist men as one of the primary obstacles to women's freedom and indeed to human liberation. She questioned whether any man who insisted on being boss in his own house could be truly devoted to liberation. In an 1895 speech, Declare called out men who claimed to be sympathetic to women's rights, but who nevertheless saw women as naturally less capable than men. Anarchist women in the Gilded Age encountered misogyny even within their own movement, shaped by influences of church, state, and commonly held notions of women's biological inferiority. This sexism led Declare to view women's freedom as a central tenet of revolutionary anarchism. Without the destruction of the patriarchy, true anarchism could never be achieved. Declare saw firsthand that anarchist free love did not necessarily ensure women's liberation, particularly when it was stained by patriarchal tradition. Each time she was treated as a subservient sex object or felt her individuality subsumed by a romantic relationship, she became more convinced that living with a man was to be avoided at all costs. The suffering she experienced in romantic relationships fundamentally shaped her understandings of marriage, womanhood, and anarchism. During this period, structures of capital, patriarchy, and the state made it difficult for anarchists to create the revolutionary world they sought. Free love was an attempt to enact anarchist theory in intimate life, a space that proponents hoped would destroy power hierarchies in the home. Although many of Free Love's goals are commonplace today, such as contraception and women's legal rights to bodily autonomy, at least for now, others, such as non-monogamy and polyamory, remain on the fringes. The points of friction that arose in anarchist Free Love, between freedom and patriarchy, revolution and tradition, 
egalitarianism and power, show how mainstream ideologies can shape even the most radical social movements. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.